Don't give up when someone denies you your right. Thank you very much. This is this month's legislative update. Continue pushing it a step forward. We two bodies are all not alike. Yeah. Right? If you give people the chance and the encouragement and some supports, amazing things can happen. Hello, I'm Mark Hughes. Welcome to Disability Viewpoints. We have a very special show today. We're talking about the guardianship law and its changes here in the state of Minnesota. My special guests today are going to be Alicia Munson, Public Policy Director of the Ark of Minnesota, Jean Hoff, an advocate, and Mary Hoff, the parent of an advocate. But more importantly, my special co-anchor today is Nikki Bill Vincencio. It's been a while since you've been on the show, but welcome back, Nikki. Hey, Mark. Great to see you guys. Yeah. Um, Thank you. And who's your special guest today? Well, I get the privilege of interviewing Jennifer Keelan Schaffin. She was the youngest person to crawl up the steps of the uh, D.C. Uh, Capitol at the ADA. And so I thought it'd be great to honor the ADA that way. And next to me, I have my assistant, Allie <laughs> Pulse. And I have the book with me all the way to the top. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm sounds, excited. Sounds great. I, I've heard of her as an author, and I know she's very good, and it's great to have you back on the show. What have you been working on? You've been interim ex uh, chair of the Minnesota State Council on Disability. Have I heard that right? Yes, yes, we are. Uh, I'm, the ch I'm the current chair, and so that's been keeping me busy, especially yeah. during pandemic it's important that we don't leave anybody behind so. that's exactly right and you had you have a great guest and we look forward to doing that and i look forward to talking about the guardianship law so all that and more coming up next on disability viewpoint stay tuned please hello i'm mark hughes welcome to disability viewpoints we have a very special show today. We're talking about the guardianship law and its changes here in the state of Minnesota. My special guests today are going to be Alicia Munson, Public Policy Director of the Ark of Minnesota, Jean Hoff, an advocate, and Mary Hoff, the parent of an advocate. Hi, Mark. Thanks so much for having me today. Again, Alicia Munson, Public Policy Director with the Ark of Minnesota. Sounds great. And uh, Mary or Jean, you want to go next? Hi, I'm Mary Hoff. I'm an advocate and a parent. Okay, and Jean, let's let's hear from you. My name is Jean Hoff. I am advocate. Sounds great. Well, good to have you all today. Alicia Munson will direct the first question to you. What changes have been made in the guardianship law this current year, and how, well, how will that affect people with disabilities? Yeah, thanks, Mark. We really appreciate this opportunity to share uh, some important updates with your viewers about changes to Minnesota's guardianship statute. There was a coalition of different advocacy organizations, such as the ARC Minnesota, um, Elder Justice Center, the Minnesota Disability Law Center, Min Minnesota Legal Aid, and Volunteers of America, as well as several service providers like Lutheran Social Service of America, or of Minnesota, excuse me, that, that partnered together during this previous legislative session to really make some updates to Minnesota's guardianship statute. It had been more than a decade since the last time that this law was changed. So there was a lot of stuff that was outdated and a lot of things that needed to be um, reframed to help focus on the different types of decision-making options that are available to Minnesotans with disabilities now that are less restrictive, less formal than guardianship. So I just wanted to share a couple of the main highlights with your viewers. Um, first and foremost, some changes to the definitions to make sure that individuals were at the center of the policy, um, rather than using terms like ward or protected person, we now use person subject to guardianship or person subject to conservatorship, right? Kind of that person first language change. There's also a new definition of supported decision-making, which is one of the 
various decision-making options that are available to people that are, like I said earlier, much less restrictive, that really puts power in their hands um, with some support from trusted decision-makers in their lives. And I'm really excited that Mary and Jean are with us today to tell you about their experiences with supported decision-making. But before we get to that, a couple of the other really high-level changes First of all, um, as you may know, uh, judges can issue guardianships that are limited in their powers so that the individual retains some of their decision-making capacity. Um, and now judges can issue guardianships that are limited in their time. There's kind of been a standard, especially for young adults with disabilities, that once they're 18, their parent gets guardianship and they're subject to that guardianship for the rest of their life. Now judges can issue time limited guardianships for say six months, a year or several years. But even further than that, the bill mandated it made sure that anyone younger than 30 was subject to a time limited guardianship. So their guardianship could not be longer than 72 months and they'd have to kind of go back and take a look at all of the different less restrictive options that would be available to them. It's another part of the bill change that judges really have to strongly consider and weigh how less restrictive um, alternatives to guardianship have been considered and why those less restrictive alternatives didn't work before they are able to issue a guardianship. There are also some limits to the emergency guardianships. You can't extend um, beyond a 60 day period. Um, and then really some strength strengthens to the Bill of Rights. Um, we wanted to make sure that People with disabilities who are subject to guardianship are really very actively engaged in the process of decision making. We also wanted to make sure that they have access to employment and employment supports. Those are one of the things that now they have a right to as laid out in the guardianship bill of rights. Um, guardians also now have the ability to set up ABLE accounts, which are kind of like, um, kind of like retirement accounts for folks with disabilities to help them save and be more financially independent. Um, so lots and lots of changes. There are just a few that I mentioned. Uh, the ARC Minnesota has some new resources about the updated bill language on our website, a fact sheet. Uh, we're also updating our ARC guide to decision-making options. So I really wanna make sure that your viewers check those out if they want uh, more information or if they have any questions about the other changes that were made to the guardianship law this session. All of this information is so very important and the people first language, which is always something that we strive for too in the disability community. It, we don't realize how important that is too. So Alicia brought up some very good, important information here and thank her for that. Jean, what has been your experience with the decision-making process, supported decision-making process? Thank you, Mark, for inviting me to share about my experiences. Just before my 18th birthday, my parents and I talked about the need to have legal documents. In place since I was becoming an adult, they helped me find a lawyer. I met with John Tucky at VOA. I was comfortable with him as my lawyer. We worked together to create my legal documents. A healthcare directive and a power of attorney with special diversions for a supporting decision making agreement. John reviewed my documents with me before I signed them. My parents were at the meeting as my supporters. The process not hard or scary. I felt empowered. I did not have to go to court. A judge has not taken away my right to make decisions about my life. I do so much part making healthcare decisions. My mom goes to my apartments with me, helps me ask questions and make choices. I have had the same doctors my whole life. So I have good doctors, patients, relationships, 
I am learning to do my budget and baking. My mom is part of me as I learn and take one more responsibility. I have my own goals in life. Baking makes me the freedom to make my own decisions with the help that I need. Mary, why is the supported decision making process so important to you now? Thanks for the question, Mark. Uh, our welcome. family learned about supported decision making from a friend and advocate, Barb Kleist. Uh, we also had a chance to attend a presentation by disability law expert, mm -hmm. Jonathan Martinez, several years before Jean turned 18. Jonathan's presentation solidified for me that supported decision making was a great alternative to a court ordered guardianship that we know some of Jean's older peers and classmates have. Our parenting decisions and expectations have always been for Jean to become an independent adult, and Jean has grown up with her own experience of living as independent life as possible. Like all young adults, Jean is growing and developing her own decision-making skills. We are right-sizing our supports, giving her the freedom and choice to live her life. As Jean's supporters, uh, we help her make crucial decisions, and we have a process to do that. The way it works is when a decision comes up, Jean either decides on her own or goes over the issue with us. We review information and choices together and discuss options and consequences of the different choices. We're not her guardians, as she does not how need much? someone okay. to determine how to live her life. In addition, I've also been utilizing supported decision-making principles to support my 89-year-old mother, Joanne. My siblings and I have helped her through a number of complicated health issues, including her most recent struggle with mixed dementia. As her memory loss has progressed, we have increased our support and assistance with decision making. We strive to make um, uh, uh, respect her wishes, helping her age with dignity, retaining a balance of safety and autonomy while preparing for the next phase of her life without removing her civil rights to a guardianship. Not only are we her children, we are her advocates. I believe no matter a person's stage in life, whether their capacity is growing or diminishing, they should have access to individualized natural supports that help them live with dignity, autonomy, and self-determination. Very good. And uh, uh, Jean, the, the next question goes to you. How has the supported decision-making process plan helped you to plan for your next steps? I am making my own decision to go to college. I have a career and live a pandemic. My family is a part of me in making my decision for the life that I want. I applied to several colleges. College will give me a chance to continue my learning make new friends and live on my own. In a couple of weeks, I started my college classes through the skin university. I'm excited for college. I am pursuing a career in mass media. I am ready to get starting work to help two companies with their social media. Let's party decision making give gives me the responsibility and independence to make inferred choices on my own and with the, the support that I need. That's good. All right, now I want to move to the final word segment of the show, and that is I'm going to let Alicia Munson go first. Anything we might have missed in this about a half hour that you want to cover quickly? Thanks, Mark. I would just say that I think it's really important for all of us, you know, within the disability community to, to shift our thinking about what's possible for people with disabilities. So long the narrative has been um, about what people with disabilities can't do. And we really need to reclaim that and, and make sure that all of us are talking about the resilience and wisdom and capacity of people with disabilities and their power and um, how they can really live self-determined and self-directed lives. And I think some of the changes to the guardianship statute um, and advances with supported decision-making are really helping helping bring that to life. That's great. Uh, Mary and Jean, I wanna give you next the final word segment. Mary, I think we'll 
uh, go first with you. If you have anything you want to cover that we might have missed within the last half hour or so. Um, no, I thanks for the opportunity and um, appreciate you helping raise awareness about supported de decision making and, and what's what's possible. And Jean, you're a real superstar today. Thank you all for being here. Thank you very much to Alicia Munson too for taking time out of her busy day from Mark, Minnesota Policy Director. And Mary and Jean, thank you for being here. And we'll see you next time on Disability Viewpoints. And bye for now. Hey, welcome back to Disability Viewpoints. My name is Nikki Villavicencio, and I'm one of the co-hosts of this wonderful show with Mark Hughes. Today, I have the wonderful privilege and honor to interview Jennifer Keelan Chaffins, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, Jennifer, but um, if you see right next to me, I have the book all the way to the top, and it is a story about Jennifer and the um, amazing history of the Americans with Disabilities Act. I'm sure all of you know who's watching that it's the 30 year anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so I really thought it would be such an honor to be able to, well, honor the ADA by having Jennifer on Disability Viewpoint. So um, welcome, Jennifer. Thank you for being so willing um, to uh, be interviewed by us. It's um, great to see you. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Yeah, so, um, you know, just to ground everybody in case not everybody's had a chance to read the book, which I highly, highly recommend anybody go out and read it. Um, can you just give us in your own words, like a, a, um, a brief description of the book? Sure, um, all the way to the top is um, my biography about um, how I joined the disability rights movement and my participation in the Capitol crawl when I was eight years old. That's awesome. That's, I, you know, I was just remembering this morning, I was six years old when it happened and you, um, you know, it must have been such an amazing thing as a, as a child to have experienced that. And, you know, I just love the fact that, um, that you were determined to do it because you knew that um, kids needed a voice, kids with disabilities needed a voice. What was it like to be one of the only kids to climb the Capitol? Um, at 1990? Um, well, as a young child who got to be so closely involved in this movement, I realized that I had a great responsibility to not just represent myself, but to represent my generation and future generations of kids with disabilities. And so when I decided to do the Capitol Crawl, um, that was one of the reasons why I was so determined to do it, because you are exactly right. Um, I knew that kids with disabilities, their voices did need to be heard, um, not just the adults, but their voices as well. And so I wanted to make sure that not only my voice was heard, but their voices were heard as well. That's awesome. And thank you for that, because, you know, um, I grew up in small town, Wisconsin, and I didn't know about that, but I'm sure so proud to know about it now. Um, I have a daughter and I read the book to her. I've read it to her multiple times and it's affected not only her life, but um, her friend's life as well. So one thing that I was wondering and thinking of that is how did your peers back when you were eight years old, um, what did they think about it when you went back home and you told them about it? What did they think? Um, I think that my peers at the time, you know, they thought that it was um, that it was really cool that I got to participate in something that was so important and that it was on television and everybody got to see it. But I think that what is, um, you know, what has most affected me now and, and what I'm looking at now is how those kids as adults um, view the, um, the Capitol crawl and, um, and that march and what they, they think about it today and how important it is today um, versus back then. I think that they, you know, they um, have realized the importance of it more now, 30 years later, 
than, than the direct impact that it had um, back then. Because, but you know, back then, you know, they they were um, the same age as me, so they they thought it was really cool, and they thought that um, that it was really cool that I participated in such an important event. But I think it has affected people more now, thirty years later, than than even back then. Yeah, I totally get that. And, you know, I mean, changing minds is the hardest th part of this whole movement, right? right. And, and so I, I totally agree with you. It Progression takes time, you know, changing mind takes time. And so um, another question I have for you is, how has the climb you did affect the work that you've done for young people with disabilities now? I think that, um, you know, first and foremost, um, when the ADA was stuck in committee and we did um, the Capitol Crawl and the um, Wheels of Justice March, I think that um, it it's more important now um, to, you know, continue on the work. And so I think that, you know, for, for people today and for kids today, now that we have the ADA, now that it's you know in place, it's more important now to continue on that work and to make sure that that kids today have that personal empowerment piece, um, so that they can continue on empowering themselves and and making sure that their civil rights are heard and continue. Absolutely, and you know your story just proves that you don't have to be an adult to make changes happen, and I think. That message is something that all children need to hear and we need to keep it heard. And the fact that it's through a person with a disability such as yourself is even more impactful. Um, so, uh, you, know, you know, one thing about the, I mean, I think the book is just fabulous. The whole book is amazing. I love the beginning part where it talks a little bit from your voice and then it tells the story in, a form that you know anybody can understand because it's in the form of a children's book which is amazing but what's your favorite part of the book i think that my favorite part of the book is you know when it talks about um that it's not just about me it's about all those kids with disabilities who get stopped every day and that i want to make sure that that those voices um are heard as well and so i think that for me, one of the you know important parts of the book is not only that, but also um, you know one of the pages um, talks about the very first uh, disability rights chant that I learned, which is the people united will never be defeated, and I think that that was important to me even as a young child because um, it talks about the fact that everyone can join in, everyone can have that voice. And, and join in and, and, and participate. And I think that, you know, it's, it's time for all of us to have that one united voice again and join in and, and continue to, um, to make sure that our voices are heard. Definitely, I'm right there with you. Um, you know, I've done uh, ADAPT actions in DC, obviously many years after you were there. And that is always something that sticks in your heart. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, once you start um, getting involved in, in things that are bigger than yourself, uh, it's something that never leaves you. And I think that I can see that clearly within yourself. And so I just want to, again, thank you for all the things that you've done. But what I want to know is what's next for you now? What are things that you're working on or what's something you're excited for in the future? Um, some of the things that I'm working on now is that um, you know one of the cool things about this book is that it is a teaching tool. It's a teaching tool to teach the next generation the importance about the disability rights movement and the Capitol crawl. And I think that um, that um, for me, um, one of the cool things about this book is that it comes with a a teacher's guide to teach the next generation um, its importance four grades, one through five. So I think that um, for me, that's part of the the, uh, the work that I want to, to do and to continue 
is to teach the importance of the next generation, the importance of the disability rights movement, and to teach that personal empowerment piece about the ADA. Um, in other words, it's not just about what's written in the law, it's about that personal empowerment that we have to teach the next generation in order for them to um, continue on and make sure that their voice is heard. I also think that, you know, for me personally, we still have a lot to work to do when it comes with the to the ADA. We still have um, that um, um, that um, attitudinal barriers that people face people with disabilities face every day. And so we, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done when it comes to, um, to uh, housing and um, um, employment and those types of things um, to make sure that the, um, the ADA is fully uh, realized and recognized and implemented. Absolutely, thank you so much. And you know, I was wondering, I love the idea of having it as a curriculum in schools. Do you have more information about that? I do. Actually, um, teachers and parents can download the um, curriculum guide um, on my website directly or on um, Source Books website. Um, again, it's for uh, grades one through five, and it teaches um, it helps teachers um, teach the the um, the lessons um, that are uh, associated and accompanied with the book. Oh, awesome! Can you tell us what that website is? Your website? Sure, it's jkclegacy.com. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Jennifer Keelan Schaff and everybody. Um, thank you so much for uh, being willing to be interviewed. Thank you. And good luck on all your future endeavors. Thank you very much. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of the Disability Viewpoints. I'd like to thank my special guests today, and they were Alicia Munson, Public Policy Director at the Arc of Minnesota, Mary Hoff, a parent advocate, and Jean Hoff, an advocate for uh, the um, guardianship law changes in, in Minnesota and the changes that have taken effect this year. We hope you all at home have been informed now and learned a lot about that. And more importantly, we want to thank Nikki Villavincencio uh, for being our co-anchor uh, today. And Nikki, you had a great guest. It was very informative. And Allie, we want to thank you for being such a superstar on this production. We hope you come back again. And please say hi to your dad. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Mark. I hope everybody's staying safe and uh, just want to remind everybody to vote in November. Right, and we'll, we'll see you uh, for Tuesday at the Capitol in 2021. And again, wear your COVID mask uh, safely per Governor Walz's order. Thanks again for watching Disability Viewpoints. We'll hope you join us next time. On behalf of uh, Allie and the whole team, thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. Bye now. <laughs>